we are continuing with our uh, fourth session on economic survey today there will be only uh, two chapters which will be discussed one is upon the services another one is upon agriculture so once we are done with this the last session will have on uh, the other infrastructure things which i told you which will be happening in the subsequent week with that we'll be finishing the uh, survey right and uh, whatever we are going to see uh, now will be mostly uh, factual and data based most of the schemes and uh, the programs which are there in the services sector and in the agriculture sector you might be knowing so it's only going to be like a revision for you about the current affairs whatever you have done uh, so far so some uh, data and statistics we will be presenting here uh, it's not mandatory for us to <clears throat> memorize such data or the statistics it is only to know the positioning of uh, india in uh, terms of like exports or in terms of the fda performance so we are going to give you some uh, picture about the uh, country's position in the global level so they are all going to be useful later when you are going to write your uh, uh, mains examination in the prelims they won't ask you uh about exactly about the data or the statistics anyways it's going to be analytical right so with this uh, first we'll uh, have a look at the services i hope in the last class uh, we were talking about the external sector we did a bit on the basics also we studied about the balance of payment and uh, we studied about external debt right in that uh, larger discussions were happening in terms of balance of invisibles if you remember upon the services account so under the balance of invisibles you had three things so services investment income as well as the uh, transfers today we are going to talk only about the services in this particular chapter there are lots of merits which are going with the uh, services sector the moment i mention the services sector you all will be uh, remembering about the it services secondly the major word which will go with the services will be exports so these are the two key things which uh, anybody will expect out of this chapter there are lots of statistics supporting that but before getting into the chapter also i would like to mention the two key words which uh, now it is very essential for us to remember one is about the contact intensive services and then the contact less services so if you recall back our first chapter you would have uh, uh, like heard about the point that the contact intensive services all got into trouble contact less services were the one which were doing well in spite of covid but now this uh, this chapter is going to tell you all the types of services are bouncing back there is a resilience in all the types of services and uh, repeatedly you are going to hear about the word called as the pent up demand you remember that day we made use of the word pent up demand which means like there was a uh, lower level of uh, demand and suddenly there is a spike in demand so these will be the major essence of this uh, services and uh, economic survey has uh, named the uh, chapter as uh, services as sources of strength right so if we look at uh, all the key points what we said is going to come into the introduction we are into the top 10 uh, service exporting country we are actually seeing the rebounding or bouncing back of all the contact intensive service sector can you give me some examples of this contact intensive services sector huh? tourism hospitality the hotel industry banking banking was also done online but of course certain parts of banking we do have to come offline right education of course it was also done online hospital was anyways done because for covid we had to go to the hospital so hospit hospitality tourism and uh, transportation uh, all types of transportation railways roadways airways everything was affected at the time of uh the covid restrictions so they are all the things which are actually bouncing back right and also they are talking about the release of the pent up demand uh, mainly because of the universal vaccination which we were able to achieve uh, we would have studied about this index in the first two chapters called as purchasing managers index if you remember we would have mentioned in different different contexts 
but there is a pmi which is specifically given for services as such so anywhere this kind of a pmi index if you see you have to uh, interpret that if the value is more than 50 that particular sector is expanding if the value is less than 50 that particular sector is contracting so they are looking at for the services as a sector and they are saying that now it is bouncing back and the values are going above 50 right so mainly to show that that there is a demand for the raw materials purchasing managers index are going to tell you about whether we need the raw materials to do the particular service or not so here they are giving you the percentage of the growth uh, uh, specific to the services sector um, there is a merit to this uh, uh, sector you know that gdp usually they mention the number like 5% 6% 7% right but always the services sector will be on a higher level than the overall gdp it will be somewhere around 8% 9% 10% right so after a long time we are again moving out of that 7.8% to 8.4% and the third point they would have said like the government is again expecting that it will grow up to 9% in the future right so the diagram you can also see in 2021 there was a dip but when again if you see on the right hand side you can see that it's between this 8 to 9% and even sometimes above 10% percentage right so uh, you are all clear with the word gva uh, we know the difference between gdp at market price gdp at factor cost and gva at basic price right so here uh, they are basically calling it as gva instead of gdp so that is what is presented and year on year growth is also given right so again uh, they have mentioned that mainly because your hotel and the tourism industry has uh, recovered the rate is actually expected to go to 9 percentage this is that pmi services you can see that there is one black dotted line which is marking that 50 so if the graph is falling below that this is all that covid period where we can see that services were shrinking slowly now we are rising above that 50 uh, number mark and towards december 2022 it has started slowly increasing so we are seeing that there is lot of uh, demand which is getting created for the services uh of course uh, after the covid there was also a slump mainly because of the war situation but now slowly we are uh, increasing uh, at least from december we can sep september to december we can see a increasing trend right when the sector is doing better off than the before it will also require financial uh, support mainly the institutional credit so you can see that the credit has started growing very fastly like around 20 21 percentage these are all different percentage numbers to show year on year growth but generally to indicate to uh, uh, that the sector is actually bouncing back these are all the evidences which we are generating here so they are saying in november 2022 we had the very highest growth which is something like which we have not seen in the past 46 months just like in 2 to 3 years we have not seen such a kind of a growth uh this data again we would have seen as part of our external sector the last class where we talked about the mercantile trade and services uh, trade so again they are presenting here three things uh in the balance of invisibles just pick up only the services account nothing else here so you are seeing this uh, services import in the green colored uh, graph services exports in the red colored graph and the difference between these two things is what has been presented as the gray color bar so you can see that uh, there is a net positive receipt and that receipt is actually increasing there can be two reasons for this one either the imports are reducing two the exports can be increasing right so you can see actually the imports are remaining the same exports are slowly increasing which is the reason why this gray color bar is actually becoming taller which means that why is this exports uh, increasing you remember they were mentioning about the global growth may actually slow down a bit and all they were cautioning in the first chapter 
because everywhere there is monetary tightening happening everywhere there is a inflationary condition whenever tightening happens obviously the growth will have a compromise but in spite of that in spite of the warning there can be situation that in other countries uh, because of the inflationary situation things may be or the services may be costlier so in which case they may be wanting to outsource to other countries you remember we mentioned the word export is other countries consumption whereas we produce this mic we consume it here it is domestic consumption if we produce this and send it abroad it is other countries consumption though we are going to call it as export it is somebody else's demand it's not our country's demand so in such case because of this kind of a, a difficult situation across the world maybe their own country's production will be difficult but they may be importing from us which becomes export to us so therefore the second point they have given here mainly because of the runaway inflation in many uh, countries we have a good scope of exporting the services at a lower price therefore we are also seeing this exports are actually increasing you are all familiar with the word runaway inflation no creeping inflation walking inflation running inflation upper ma rendu type ஹைப்பர் இன்ஃபிளேஷன் நடுவில் ஒன்னு காணுமே keeping that in the scenario we are trying to export our services to other countries which is why the spike is happening but still we have to be cautious about the global level growth be slowing down so these are the warnings which are given here so far we had been mentioning like uh, services services in the specific uh, word uh, under the services we are going to the components if you ask what are all the major services which you know the first and topmost thing which you are going to mention is the software right it related things so that is what is actually uh, having this uh, kind of an increasing trend uh, it may be looking like the previous graph on this graph is almost the same but that's how the trend for the uh, services exports are also there that software exports so among the services exports software exports are very very resilient mainly because of the digital support and the cloud things we are all now making more use of the word cloud because of the online services utilization and uh, the ones which got impacted again needless to mention it was about the transportation uh, services which we also saw in the external sector thing right this is a data about uh, fdi in services right we have studied uh, enough basics about the foreign direct investment so they are coming to do business over here whenever somebody is coming from abroad we should give them ease of doing business so that they'll be able to invest more in our country and approvals uh, regulations rules everything should be simplified and there should be some single window system so that they will be able to approach one particular ministry or one particular window and get all the sanctions done so that they can start with the business all of these things are improving in the country and uh, whenever you talk about the fda you should talk about the limits say for example in insurance uh, they have uh, increased it from 49% to 74% in telecommunications they have opened up up to 100% so, uh, i know you know the basic uh, rules of the uh, fdi investments right except for the strategic sector the rest of the sector so the government keeps revising how much amount the foreigners they can come and invest in india mostly it is 49% or 74% or 100% so these are all the different ranges within which the investment comes in so they keep on revising these things they keep on opening up the new avenues therefore more investment is actually coming inside the services sector if we say like uh, uh, fdi is coming like up to 80 us dollar billion up to 10 percentage or specifically is all going into this uh, software related thing already i showed you in the previous slide services means it's mostly dominated by the it or the software sector similarly uh the dollar is also mostly moving into the services sector specifically to the software things 
so these are all the measures which have been taken by uh, india to improve the fdi with that we are seeing as the seventh largest recipient of fdi there are lots of largest for india if you remember remittances also we are one of the largest countries receiving lot of amount similarly fdi also we are on the seventh largest recipient the last point we mentioned about insurance in the previous slide FDI is coming like forty nine to seventy four percentage. So a bit more of detail on the insurance sector. Again, uh, <clears throat> you remember we mentioned something about insurance penetration, insurance density. In one of the chapters of economic survey, we mentioned about that. How many people go for insurance? How much premium is being paid for the insurance? those are all uh, see as much as we are uh, going ahead for the insurance more and more organized system is happening in the country if you go and see the developed countries and all most of them will be insured very less this dependent population unemployed people they are the people who will not be insuring themselves insurance means it's not just for the life if you remember we had even discussed about the life on the non life under the non life we discussed about the motors health related theft related fire related there were varieties of things so here we are trying to say that insurance is being discussed as a service uh, sector major uh, 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 one kind of a service where we are again seeing one single window portal where we can uh, go and approach for the uh, issue ones this is not just on the consumer side so you people will apply for the insurance but there should be providers who can give the insurance with the different types of products and there should be easiness from the provider side also so that uh, more business will happen in the insurance sector so which is what we are mentioning you don't have to go and uh, talk to iridai every time I, you launch one new product or a service uh, the rules and regulations in india were very very strict uh, you are familiar with sebi you know sebi what is sebi okay what does sebi do regulating share market you know anything uh, like even the, you would have uh, heard very familiar word mutual funds is it not every time a scheme is launched under the mutual fund you have to go and seek uh, approval of sebi to launch it into the market similarly whatever you do in the insurance market you have to go to iridai to get it approved but nowadays they are making the rules and regulations much more simpler so that these people they don't have to go and tell i am launching a new product new service kind of a, a thing so these are all getting uh simplified that's why we call it as ease of doing business and there are lots of technologies uh, these days even for the two wheeler i think if you get into a petrol bunk you'll be able to do an insurance is it not and they give you most of the online facilities icici lombard many things are available today so that with the technology available you can do the insurance at the fastest way right so they are saying all of these things are slowly improving india's uh, stature and you can see india is becoming 10th largest in the world in terms of uh, starting to apply for the insurance now about the uh, tourism sector which was the hard core hit during the covid situation uh, after the pandemic they are trying to say that like around 60 to 65 percentage recovery is there now so people were traveling to every destination we have not reached back the full swing of what we were doing pre pandemic at least 60 to 65 percentage we have reached to that level and uh, they have introduced a word called as mice what is this mice they are talking about meetings incentives conventions right exhibitions they are all contact intensive things meetings means uh, physical meetings like this gathering should happen all because of uh, relaxation of the covid restrictions only now it is becoming possible for the meetings people are traveling abroad everywhere through the flights so that is actually bouncing back right and tourism is also bouncing back for the leisure uh we have uh, different types of tourism in the next slide we are also going to talk about the medical tourism so these uh, these two uh, statistics are belonging to the academic or the business oriented uh, trips and leisure related trips everything is improving and when they are saying the trips are actually increasing the average room rate and occupancy how much revenue all those things are important for the hospitality industry so they are giving statistics this uh, blue color line you can see that average 2019 levels so pre pandemic how much occupancy rate was all there 
how much revenue the hotels were uh, earning so are we getting closer to it by november 2022 we are seeing that we are actually reaching the 2019 levels so this is for the hotel occupancy rate and this is for the revenue per available room so this is also slowly improving and we are reaching the pre pandemic levels and this is about the foreign tourist arrivals we still have not reached the 2019 level but definitely there is a spike you can see that towards the end of the last uh, year like october 2022 and all we were trying to fill in the gap which means like apart from the academic thing leisure tourism is also starting to increase now we are uh, going a bit on the medical tourism side right so india is uh, considered to be a very good destination for lot of medical facilities here government is also putting up websites like heal in india have you seen this website heal in india ministry of health and family welfare ministry of ayush they all have uh, combinedly given uh, things so starting from uh, inquiring which type of uh, facility cardiology facility or whatever they want to do which doctor which hospital how do i travel how do i book an appointment everything is done online so this heal in india is a global medical tourism market related website which is a government's website coming under ministry of health and family welfare this itself could be a question in your prelims who is actually hosting this heal in india right so we are again ranked 10 out of the top countries in the world for the medical uh, tourism and uh, nidhi and sathi they both are talking about the hospitality industry hospitality is again about your hotels on the tourism related all the facilities only but they are having one perspective from the covid related restrictions because post covid there were lots of restrictions how many people can stay what are all the sanitation uh, requirements there were lots of uh, requirements which they had to uh, fulfill so according to that how they should be trained all those things has been given under sathi nidhi is national integrated database of hospitality industry so there are lots of hotels and other varieties of facilities in india to address this hospitality but everything is getting uh, regulated by the government so they are all coming under the government's uh, purview and a loan guarantee scheme for covid affected tourism service sector uh, if you have heard many of them would have even sold their businesses during the covid mainly the small msmes relating to the hospitality industry uh, paying the rents or paying the running expenses during the covid without having a business is a very very risky thing for the business people and at that time if they had taken you remember there were like uh, emis can be deferred for 3 months 6 months rbi was giving us uh, some options so loan guarantee scheme was also given for this kind of tourism affected uh, like uh, due to the affected uh, sector and regional connectivity scheme this is very very essential because udan scheme is actually helping in different ways to connect different parts of the country if this improves only again the tourism can actually bounce back and uh, visas were also issued uh, freely post this pandemic level in order to improve the tourism sector this is a real estate uh, sector uh, picture we are slowly moving ahead from the services uh, software slowly into tourism and then the next sector is the real estate uh, <clears throat> the first point is actually a very interesting point for all of us to know working from anywhere boosted residential real estates in tier 2 and tier 3 cities so we will be wondering why work from home should be boosting the real estate sector is it not if you have to come to the job physically only then you have to be within the city limits so that you will get a bus or you can come by a two wheeler or anything if you can sit and work from home whether you are in outer uh, suburban or you are kanchi puram or you are in salem nothing matters is it not so the tier 2 tier 3 cities real estate actually improved because people they wanted to go back to their native places they wanted to settle there they felt much safer not being in chennai was very very seen as a safer option when covid was there people fled out of chennai 
you know uh, at that time when they will give that relaxation after 15 days after 15 days they will open up for one or two days you should have seen the roads on those two days right people will always want to go back to their native place if they are doing farming they will feel very very safe so those were the conditions and therefore real estate sector has taken a edge based upon that uh, work from home thing also of course uh, regarding this um, real estate government has also come forward to give the housing for all and you know the avas yojana which is running for several years uh, constructing the houses in the rural re- regions smart city projects recently they announced in pundamalli that uh, area some 1000 crores or kind of they keep identifying areas and then they do the smart city projects that is also improving now but with all these positive things there is still difficulty because in the construction real estate means obviously you have to acquire a land and then start doing the construction but getting the raw materials there is lot of problems right right from the steel iron several other raw materials which is required cement and all those things which we are importing also uh, many of the raw materials it's getting affected due to the war and the inflationary situations this is one interesting index you can see that global real estate transparency index india has improved a lot in this which means that see uh, when we were discussing about the types of investments in the last class did we mention that whenever there is a uh, share market problems people go towards gold right so whenever there is a share market uh, problem it's not just with the gold people also go and buy land right if you talk about physical assets there are only two major types of assets which you can talk one is the gold another one is the land uh, both are in our indians mind uh, both are equivalent to each other gold and the land value based so therefore we are actually talking about the property acquiring uh, the real estate sector here so when the rules and regu- and you also know that both this physical assets gold and the land is the area where you have more of black money circulation have you heard about it have you heard about the guideline values guideline value means uh, to what value you can buy that land government will have a value you know how much one ground is uh, valued in uh, annanagar <coughs> one ground you are all sitting in annanagar according to the guideline value uh, if you say like one square feet is something like 10000 or 11000 uh, in the market rate it will be 20000 so there is a difference 2400 square feet if you want to buy in one rate the market rate will be actually double if you can buy in 1 crore or 2 crore the market rate will be around 4 crores what is happening with this 2 crore where is this amount going on uh, it is all the black money circulation if you declare and do the of course you can do the registration for 4 crores but the moment you want to do the registration you have to pay stamp duty 11% now they have reduced a bit but anyway 7 to 11 percentage you will have to pay it therefore people uh, in gold also anybody is giving uh, money and then uh, taking bill for uh, gold thing of course some of the uh, uh, bigger shops they do that you, they insist upon uh, doing the billing of it but gold as well as the land both are the places where you can uh, do the black money circulation land in a larger level gold to a limited level that is why this word transparency is very very important see we have to bring in more rules and regulations to make the process transparent so that people will avoid doing these uh, kind of uh, black money transactions so they are doing uh, lots of uh, this uh, activities from the government how can we register all the details how can we give online patta uh, there are different states like maharashtra which is giving up rera platforms uh so digitization of the land records everything is going to help us uh, make this transparency bit better i'll show you one uh, this is the index from which uh, the economic survey has taken out the data so explore real estate transparency by market i want a map to come varuma varada ah 
here is the map so you are going to see how transparent is india in terms of uh, they have given six key categories you can see here investment performance market fundamentals governance of listed vehicles regulatory and legal environment transaction process sustainability transparency these are the six categories in which uh, basically they are wanting to judge whether our market is transparent or not and you can read uh, the graph very light colored thing are transparent goes with the logic light colored things will be more transparent is it not so uh, as much as it is becoming dark colored you are very rigid you are not very transparent which means you are bad so where should india be light colored or in dark colored <laughs> light colored you <laughs> wait 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 uh, you are seeing the different colors is it not looking at the colors can you say which is the first or top countries i am waiting for the answer uh, i'll show you uh, as soon as you keep it will show you the rank and the score okay you are seeing united states of america and you are seeing the red colored things right all of them should be fully red then it means you are having good value and uh, uh and you gain higher ranks so this is rank 2 okay you want to see rank 1 we'll see what is india first ah uh, we are rank 36 but this itself uh, our country is saying we have become very good that you should see i'll show you this and i'll go back there ah uh, we have become Uh, better from 2.8 to 2.73 so that they are saying we have improved a lot in terms of the transparency so now you know how much transparent we are you say this uk right so us is in the second rank there are lots of countries which are ranked uh, two but you can see that united kingdom having 1.25 how much was our data 2.73 right so half like very much less than us and uh, this is the market score for the six different key indicators and us is actually ranking first so india's rank is 36 in this So a long way to go but still at least we can understand how the countries are being positioned uh, across things so that's about the real estate transparency index how we are becoming better off this is about that it bpm what is this bpm business process management so basically again another form of our services that's taking the major share i'm going to show you graphs in the next slide regarding this and we are calling ourselves as very much uh, digitally talented and this particular sector is growing by 10 percentage right so this is the statistics related to it one is given as the countries another one is given as the types of services so where exactly you know we are a very good export uh, i it services exporting country particularly it bpm exporting country so where exactly it is going this is going to asia pacific uh, region that's what is written here as apac and then we also send to usa uk and uh, europe those are the three other things whereas in terms of the types of services you can see that it is again your it services which is dominating with the 51 percentage and then you have your business process management which is this 19 to 20 percentage followed by your research and development software products is very less the rest of the things are larger but 51 percentage to the it services 62 percentage to the asia pacific region these are the statistics which the government wants to present so it sector performance is very good in terms of exporting 
coming to the e-commerce slide i have put first three points up and then the next four points down first three points are basically to talk about the private sectors uh, role in the e-commerce promotion of course we have lots of uh, online facilities now thanks to all our uh, financial interfaces whichever has come in it has helped us a lot in terms of doing the e-commerce and uh, with the smartphone penetration with phone pay your google pay many things have started becoming possible even in the rural india and they are talking about tier 3 tier 4 cities e company is uh, like uh, misho these kind of companies are also penetrating at lower levels looking at the government side of course we have already talked about this government basically we have to look at all the e commerce platforms one is the government's platform and then one district one product what is all what is it all about one district one product e commerce le vikkalam but what is so specific about this have you studied this in our current affairs can you tell me one feature of this apart from the title whichever is specific to that particular district mostly it is agricultural in nature which is what i wanted as the answer mostly identification of one particular that whichever good product is there coming from the district it belongs to the uh basic sector subsistence sector it comes from the agriculture sector right we are discussing about services sector chapter but we are talking about the subsistence sector product we are bringing that product and we are exchanging it through the service which is available in the e-commerce so this is also helping lot of exchange between the producers and the consumers this kind this particular scheme of the government Trifood is again trying to help the tribal people to bring in their uh, products and then sell it on the e-commerce. An open network for digital commerce, I think we have discussed enough of uh, it, which is helping both the buyers and the sellers to connect each other to do the transactions. So all of these efforts are seeming to be coming from the government side in order to promote the e-commerce. Now, when you look at what are all the items which are getting actually traded on the e-commerce, you can see that mobile electronic appliances is contributing up to 45 to 50 percentage. Your fashion items, what are the fashion items? Anything which is related to the cosmetics and other things. So that's like around 20 to 25 percentage. Groceries and general merchandise, right? So basically to buy from the big basket kind of things, lots of the groceries essential. So that's another 20 to 25 percentage, but they are projecting that this grocery should become bigger. Fashion, of course, they want to retain because this is going to become bigger. We expect that the mobile and the electronic appliances will become slightly shorter, right? So there is a larger future which is seen for the uh, general merchandise to improve because of the easily available facilities. Can you mention any of the e-commerce facilities which you are using on the day-to-day -day basis? Zepto, Danzo, uh, Porter app, you can lift anything and put it anywhere, is it not? Anything emergency, Zepto and all, he says he will deliver in 10 minutes and he does it, right, usually. So there are lots of uh, deliveries and transactions happening. Looking at the digital financial services, uh, India is doing very good in terms of this because we are adopting the financial technology, whatever is coming at the global level. You can see that it is up to 87 percentage. And we have lots of neo banking platforms also coming up. What is the difference between our commercial banks and the neo banks? Huh? It is only digital presence. So there will not be any physical presence for these banks. Uh, whatever facilities which the physical percent banks, commercial banks are giving, we call it as internet banking, net banking, whereas uh, these calls are called as neo banking, which doesn't have a physical. Are they governed by RBI? No. They are indirectly governed by RBI. Why we should make use of the word indirect? Can you give me any one example for our neo banks in India? Any facility? 
Airtel, Paytm banks. You have heard about Razor Pay. Huh? Razor Pay. So assume that you want to do a Paytm bank. Whatever through the Paytm you are doing it. There will be a wallet. There will be a wallet, and uh, you have to add the funds into the wallet, and that will be distributed to whatever QR code or the number you want to give. Razor Pay is also similar. They all will go and touch the commercial banks. How do you fill in the wallet? Can you go and pay the cash into the wallet? There is no physical presence, so you can't do that. So therefore, it is to be called as indirect. Because commercial banks are all governed by RBI, whatever neo banks you are mentioning, they will go and touch the uh, commercial banks for the transaction, and therefore they are getting indirectly uh, governed by RBI. There will be some rules and regulations to control them. So this is also giving a lot of help uh, for the improving the digital transactions. You have heard about the central bank digital currency also, is it not? It's like. the cryptocurrencies legalized cryptocurrencies for india we are trying to bring it on a pilot basis now to the wholesale and the retail uh, uh, segments uh, basically uh, can you and me go and hold the account with rbi today no no yes no we can't but when this digital currency kind of thing comes he will be able to hold accounts because it's going to be released only by rbi central bank digital currency of course they will ask us to maintain account with the commercial banks from there they will elevate us to rbi but who will be issuing it it will be issued by the uh, central bank so slowly we are moving towards that particular system so which is also helping us to uh, which is going to help us in terms of the transaction for the buying and the selling of commodities so that's the digital financial services i am giving all the examples what is given in survey it doesn't mean that there are only these many types of services whatever has been discussed here keeping in purview what the survey has told us right account aggregator framework i think we already discussed in earlier class this is basically a non banking financial company please make note of such points because this is what will upsc ask you they will say account aggregator framework is a finance company it is a financial intermediary it is a eo bank something they will say you need to know that it is a non banking financial company which goes and collects all of your data with your consent in order to share with other other financial institutions so that they will be giving loans to you Uh, so therefore uh, credit rating is very very essential these days you know right you need to be having good uh, net worthiness credit worthiness for you to get a loan so this checking and all will be done by these kinds of accounts aggregator framework with your consent they are going to suppose if you are having accounts in four five different banks they will be getting the details from all the banks and checking your credit rating then the loan will be sanctioned to you so but basically that is a non banking financial company so these details we are uh, getting to know from the survey which is also taken as part of the services sector this title is very uh, very specific dematerialization of documents right so basically they want to say that documents are becoming e documents you have heard about digital signatures right so these days they are also talking about uh, digital stamp uh things so if you have to pay the stamp duty earlier they last us to buy different different 10000 10000 papers nowadays they say that you just get one 10000 paper the rest of it you can pay it online so there are lots of dematerialization of documents so how do we submit the documents how we do how do we do the digital signature and uh, paperless or efforts are getting improved so they are mentioning this as the national e governance services limited nesl is there i have put up on graph in this you can look at this this is taken from the website this is not in survey survey presents the previous slide we have gone into the website to look at this so if you want to generate or if you are going to ask for a loan they will be generating one online document and then they will be submitting the document also online these kind of paper based work is all getting eliminated because we have 
digital ac acceptance through this national e governance services limited this is specific to nesl so remember this agency also if you want to talk about this dematerialization or they call it as dde right so these are the different types of services which they have uh, mentioned with that the services sector is actually done now we are moving on to the agriculture sector the largest subsistence sector the title of the chapter is written as from food security to nutritional security which has been a sustainable development goal for very very long time for india so are we really achieving it the first slide starts by saying like we have a very good uh, agricultural scenario as of now in india and you can look at this number 81 crore beneficiaries are being covered under this national food security act right how many crores of people are there in india now and then we should go and hit the macro data so that we understand what exactly is happening in india etane kodi makkal india vil irukkirargal ena unit la problem aagum unna 1.2 ena solla poringa 140 crores 140 poitama 120 130 140 okay so if you say 140 crore people 80 crore people it is something like what more than half two thirds no 60 65 60 60% age of the population is getting covered under national food security right anyways they are giving the details of it whenever you are talking about the agriculture sector they also want you to look at the allied sector which is about the livestock animal husbandry fisheries forestry other things so they are saying that is also improving first about the growth rate of the agriculture sector these numbers are all magic numbers for india because we were always with 2 to 3 percentage we were waiting and longing for years when we could actually have 4 percentage of growth rate in agriculture which is all becoming true you can see even up to 6 percentage 5 percentage again it has slowed down to 3 percentage but at least these kinds of numbers are very great numbers as long as agriculture sector is concerned we had a national agriculture mission uh, first point in that will be written as 4 percentage growth rate in agriculture that will be a great achievement for india but we are averaging out to 4.6 percentage and uh, again not only in the services sector slowly we are calling ourselves we are a net exporter of agricultural products which is also something which we should be very proud about right and they are giving the value for it how did we achieve this much of this thing uh, the volume of exports and so much of earning all of these things mainly because we are doing lot of crop diversification right intensification mechanization uh some kind of arrangements like the cooperatives or farmer producer organizations right so varieties of reforms uh, are coming into the agriculture in order to improve it and uh, you are seeing one agriculture infrastructure fund the moment you hear this you shift your mind towards post harvest it's not for doing agriculture agriculture for doing agriculture the main infrastructure what you will be expecting is irrigation is it not yes or no the rest of the things are all at the control of the farmer the only thing which the farmer is going to look up for the government or anybody else to help is water so when you talk about the agricultural infrastructure development first thing which will come into your mind will be the watershed programs or your irrigation facilities this is not about that this is not about that you should shift your mind towards harvest agriculture mudira nelamela infrastructure what is all about it is about the post harvest uh, all your marketing maintenance processing storage so that is this uh, agriculture infrastructure fund mechanization they have made a very good point we'll see that as we go ahead this is a graph which is again showing in crowding in of private investment in agriculture which is also an interesting point uh, you are familiar with this crowding in crowding out right crowding in as more things are coming into agriculture which means that private sector people are also wanting to 
uh, invest in agriculture what will they invest in agriculture we can do different types of uh, things or they can invest in the machines mechanization can improve or they can get into the cold storage facilities right so there are varieties of things in which and they are trying to prove the point that actually the private sector expenditure in uh, agriculture is increasing public is lesser in terms of the investment in agriculture then the private sector is way above it so this is seen as a very good uh, trend in agriculture this is again india's electricity consumption in agriculture so they are trying to show that it is increasing corresponding to the agriculture activities increasing the consumption is also increasing and uh, you know the politics statistics behind it right whatever uh, agriculture electricity is consumed it is free of cost at least in tamil nadu it is free of cost so that's about the gigawatt consumption this is a data which you may have to remember how many tons of million tons of the food grains india is producing this is one of the sectors which did not get affected by covid right even at the times of covid we were doing well so you can see 1920 2021 21, 21 there is only one increasing graph that's about the oil seeds then about the pulses then about the total food grains total food grains is the blue line so we are not, we are seeing a slight up and down but it is increasing so therefore uh, which is a very good uh, sign they are trying to say that even though there was a delayed monsoon in between one or two years we still had a uh, good level of food grains uh, production right so that is about uh, the you know how they calculate the growth rate in agriculture at 3% 4% say something one is based upon the value what it generates that is okay other thing is assume that uh, two uh, this is 251 then 275 285 it's all increasing in trend there is a year no 1415 to 1516 there is a slight slump you are saying 252 to what happened 251 then it's increasing to 275 so if you say that 252 to 251 it will look like there was a negative growth rate you know growth rate is always compared to the previous year it doesn't mean that there was no food gains production it was there but there was a slight reduction when compared to the previous year and again it has shifted on to the higher and higher thing so always whenever you are talking about the food grains production you have to remember this total number out of this 312 million tons how much was rice how much was wheat and how much was pulses everything they'll give in the survey they have not given in this graph but it is uh, useful for us to at least remember india is producing 315 million tons of food grains in a year crossing 300 is a very good number for the country right therefore when you are producing you have to sell is it not we know the price policy behind agriculture there are varieties of uh, supporting prices one is the minimum support price then the fair and remunerative price what else do you know Hmm? procurement price issue price you know all the varieties of prices fair and remunerative price goes to what sugar cane, sugar cane. issue price uh, will be at the time when you are giving it through the public distribution system procurement price will be the mainly this thing right uh, from the center to the states they will be giving from the states it will be going to the public distribution system and it is getting issued to the uh people so all of these prices are important and uh, you know the calculation doubling of the farmer income the politics behind it right there there are variety kind of uh, committee recommendation which comes if you say that 100 rupees is the cost of the production they will be giving you 200 rupees or 150 rupees depending upon the recommendation of the different committees they are going to tell that uh, we will be giving above the cost of production to the farmers right and uh, if you look at uh, different years they have presented here for the different types of uh, uh, crops do they give to oil seeds minimum support price do they support oil seeds do they support pulses 
do you know how many number of crops they are supporting 23 and sometimes yeah that coconut kind of thing they will include but at least you can mention that 23 so you can see that oil seeds pulses the major cereals everything is getting uh, covered so this is actually leading to the self sufficiency because per quintal whenever the price support is actually increasing then the production in the subsequent year with the farmers will also increase right so that's about the minimum support price of course uh, institutional credit to the agriculture sector is uh, increasing you can see uh, you would have studied about priority sector lending psl how much is it in that how much is for agriculture mandatory louder 18 percentage is for the agriculture and you would have studied about kisan credit card scheme right for running with the op uh, operational expenses you can make use of the kisan credit card scheme and they keep uh, enhancing the limit based upon whether you are paying back in time or not. In the Kisan credit card uh, scheme, they are talking you can take up to 3 lakh rupees with 7 percentage per annum. An additional 3 lakh, if you are giving it back properly in time, they will be giving you either they will be giving you at a lower interest rate or they will be giving you more amount, more than the 3 lakhs. Right? So these are all the crores and crores of money you can see that has been gone through the institutional credit this mechanization is what i said uh, has a uh, another perspective to look at one is submission on uh, this agriculture mechanization where they are trying to give you machines on hiring also so that you don't have to buy it every time and then incur a larger loans upon it and all the second thing is the most important point when you have increased fragmentation, see mechanization means immediately what comes into your mind is the area should be larger. Only the large scale farmers will be uh, wanting to take the tractors or tillers or other things. Whereas uh, now they are saying machines uh, should be given viable even for the small sized land holdings. So they are understanding that Indians uh, land holding is all mostly small and marginal. So accordingly, the mechanization should happen. So they have a, come to an agreement to that particular point where they still want to mechanize, though the size of the land holding is smaller. What is organic farming and what is natural farming? Without applying any chemicals is organic farming. Still, you will be doing some practices like tilling, weeding, right? So there will be proper uh, cultivational practices followed. But there will not be any chemical which will be applied. There will be some organic manure which they will be making ready and then applying it in large tunnels to it. Whereas natural farming will be what? Uh, do nothing. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just have to do the farming. You have to just do the seeding and then grow the crops and then take the harvest. So organic farming is one thing which is getting mostly... Uh, successful in the northeast states particularly we can see that Sikkim has become fully organic which means they are completely chemical free and they are also giving this uh, what is this parampara krishi vikas yojana they are going to give you some support right they are, if you are doing the organic farming they will give you like 50,000 rupees and that 31,000 you can make use for buying that organic menu so they are giving you some details about how the financial support is being given to the farmers who are involved in the organic farming. So that's uh, one set, uh, particularly in the Northeast, they are trying to do this. Whereas in case of natural farming, you can see that very uh, less in a, a area has been involved in it and fewer states are involved in it. But here also they are supporting them by looking, uh, bringing the champion farmers. They are saying that there are certain farmers who are doing very well in this. You look at them and then you do it. Uh, and uh, it's also called as zero budget natural farming. So get used to this alternative words for the natural farming also. So this is also mentioned in the survey. This is PM Kisan scheme. Uh, this is not Kisan credit card scheme. There are varieties of names sounding with Kisan Kisan. So you have to be very, very careful. This is PM Kisan scheme where they are going to give you DBT. Huh? 6,000 rupees mainly for your operational expenses. And that is going to help the farmers 
for getting the inputs and for the consumption and the agricultural infrastructure fund which they have mentioned for the post harvest management practices e nam we have already mentioned like government marketplace where they are trying to promote the e commerce here for the agriculture products specifically they want to call it as the e nam scheme from 2016 and there is one uh, department now to promote the horticulture climate smart farming practices what is this uh, now with the drone only marriages are also happening so why should not we make use of drones for everything so climate smart you send the drone everywhere go find out if there is any loss if there is any too much of watering if the soil type is okay so they are capturing the uh, facts through the climate smart farming practices and there are lots of agri tech startups this is basically to bring in more technology into the agriculture probably after the harvest they will start making use of this technologies so our age old fasal uh, bima yojana which is again going to help the farmers in case if there is a loss they are going to be insured against it whenever you talk about the fasal bima yojana there will be problem how to estimate the loss that is the uh, challenge which had been happening so you have to make use of this word area approach basis right so that's the area approach uh, you will be paying some premium depending upon your premium and depending upon the type of the natural calamity they will be estimating how much loss has happened and they will be giving you back some insurance so that is for the agriculture sector where they say that so many people five uh, five crore applications are coming every year so much of claim has happened these are things which we can't remember but at least we can say that the revamped scheme is uh, picking in voluntary participation and there is a two two step process for doing the crop yield estimation sampling technique so they are trying to improve the methodology by which they can estimate the loss and then give the compensation to the farmers and the uh, only keyword which you have to remember is this area approach have you heard this area approach somewhere else banking sector service area approach regional rural banks ah uh, one district will be adopted what is that scheme called as history of banking nationalization of bank 1969 1980 1972 ah uh, lead banks right international year of the millets service area approach is the major word which you will be making use of lead bank scheme has been asked in preliminary examination several years and you would have also studied about differential rate of interest scheme dir scheme that is also coming at our banking system have you studied these things post lunch 2 30 3 o'clock you people should help you are studying about agriculture padichom padikala eda recall aadu sollano we have studied about differential rate of interest scheme we know nationalization of banks happened okay so thankfully so international year of millets this is about uh, un's announcement that 2023 will be an international year of millets india is a very good producer of millets not many countries have this advantage so we can even export the millets we can improve the nutrition see the title of the chapter they wanted to place it as from food security to nutritional security so this is one of the way how you can actually achieve the nutritional security and this is also taken as uh one of the major things by which you can achieve the uh, sustainable development goals you can also see this as an alternative livelihood see the major things are your cereals usually you do that so in the off season mostly they will be rain fed crops right so uh, it is like your narega you have to uh, do this in the off season where it is just based upon the rain fed situation but still you will be able to make some uh crops out of it and uh, make money out of it so this is also employment generating this is also income generating and it is also nutrition generating so definitely better than narega is it not so that's uh, about the international year of the millers and they also say that uh, india is producing these many million tons 51 million tons which is accounting for 80 percentage of asia and our productivity is also good it's even higher than the uh, world's average productivity and it's a kharif crop it's a summer crop so you can and it's also depending upon the rain fed situation 
and you can achieve the nutritional support. Looking at the allied sector, they are actually talking about the uh, milk production in the world. So India is first in the milk production and uh, egg production also we are doing very well. We are third in the world egg production and meat production we are in the eighth. So the blue colored thing is the livestock where we are doing very well in the milk production. The, the dark blue and then the light blue is about the forestry and logging. Fishing and aquaculture, the, the tiniest uh, bar in this. You can see that uh, the crop sector, the overall uh, agriculture sector as such. So this will be helping us for both employment generation as well as for the income generation. Right. So they are the allied sector. All of these things are about the allied sectors here. Doubling the farmer's income. Doubling the farmer's income can't just be done by the agriculture or by horticulture. You have to focus upon the allied sector. So therefore, animal husbandry infrastructure development fund, then the Matsya Sampada Yojana, aquaculture infrastructure development fund. So all of these development funds are uh, focusing towards the allied sectors of agriculture to help the farmers earn more income. So these are all larger keywords which you can make use later when you are writing your main answer. Uh, Sahakar Se Samridhi, from cooperation to prosperity. There are lots of uh, primary agricultural cooperative societies. You would have studied in your general economics under the NABAD, there is a structure, right? Land development banks, district uh, cooperative banks, state level cooperative banks, and you will also have the primary agricultural cooperative societies. These packs are actually going to help the farmers in terms of the running expenses and small, small financing facilities they are going to give. So they are trying to improve their presence. And there was a ministry which was established in 2021. This can be asked in your examination. 2021, they have created a... You remember they created a ministry for skill development. Uh, when they were talking about demographic dividends, they were so scared uh, and they were wanting to create a ministry so that skill of the people can be uh, improve. So that's uh, similarly, now they are also focusing upon the agriculture and they are doing a separate ministry for the cooperation and they are computerizing and making the system better off so that financing facilities can be advanced. When they talk about the cooperative societies, they also talk about the multi-state cooperative societies. So bigger numbers are there in Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu. You must be wondering why Delhi is sitting in between, is it not? We are talking about cooperative societies. We are talking about primary agricultural cooperative societies. And what does national capital territory got to do with this multi-state cooperative societies? Mainly because it is capital, they would have registered everything over there. And therefore, you see Delhi becoming or taking up the second position over here. So Maharashtra leads the country with 661 cooperatives, followed by Delhi and Uttar Pradesh. This is all to promote the financing facilities to the agriculture sector and to the farmers. Food processing sector these days is being called as a sunrise sector, right? You studied that agriculture infrastructure fund, right? From there, it is all food processing. And uh, how much of it is actually helping us to alleviate the poverty and other things they are mentioning here? But you can remember this Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana. Again, there is one PM scheme, uh, mainly for the food processing sector. And there is one, uh, one district, one product, which we studied in the previous uh, slide also, where it is picked up specifically for doing the food processing. So we are identifying the product. We are giving the financing to the product. And we are wanting to improve the food processing sector so that more employment and more uh, income and poverty elevation, all those things can be done. To the uh, food processing sector, they are also uh, giving this production linked uh, incentive scheme. PLI is one type of uh, presentation where you are into the food processing sector. Lots of incentives can be given to, uh, to you by the government. They can help you with the funds or they can help you with a lower level of uh, electricity charges or they can give you some uh, 
subsidies uh, for the production. So there are lots of incentive linked scheme for the uh, food processing sector. Krishi Udan, you've heard about this, uh, mainly to help uh, lift the perishable products from one place to another place. Uh, we always think about the passengers travel with the Udan, but this is Krishi Udan and it is about the products, right? And again, they are saying there are lots of perishable food products uh, enormously produced in the northeast zone and uh, other uh, nooks and corners of the country. Everything has to be transported from the point of production to the point of consumption. Only if we do this, then the food processing can actually happen. See, actually, we are talking about nutritional security. Nutrition is not just by having variety. You have produced variety today. But you have to process it and safeguard it so that you can use it for a longer period of time and achieve that nutrition. So therefore, uh, to the title of this chapter, this nutritional security, food processing is a very, very relevant chapter or a very, very relevant point to fulfill this uh, point. So now coming back to that uh, first point with which we started with the agriculture sector, it's about the National Food Security Act, where they are trying to give uh, minimum food grains requirement to a household, as well as uh, through the Antyodhya Anna Yojana, where they are finding out the very impoverished people. Uh, below poverty line, that's one level, very highly uh, into poverty, very much impoverished people. So they are trying to give this poorest of the poor. And uh, this is by procuring through the minimum support price, they are giving it to the public distribution system and trying to reach out to the poorer people. So this is allocation of food grains under the uh, National Food Security Act. So this is what they would have uh, said about uh, that uh, 80 crores of people are being given with the food. And uh, COVID also, they allocated some amount specifically to all the households through the public distribution system. And they also have this one nation, one ration card scheme, which is also enabling the migrant workers and many other people to get the food grains from anywhere inside the country. Right. So one district, one product, one nation, one ration, they are all the keywords which you will have to remember. And this uh, slide actually shows you the amount of food subsidy. What is this? Uh, how is this food subsidy calculated? Anybody? What is food subsidy? Subsidy is given for food as food subsidy. Agreed. How do we calculate this? Uh? <clears throat> Difference between the procurement price and the difference between the minimum support price and the issue price. See, when you take a minimum support price, it's just the price which you pay to the farmers. After that, there is one storage and transportation. And then finally, it comes to the uh, uh, public distribution system. So... <clears throat> Do we pay anything for the food in the public distribution system? Have you ever gone to a ration shop? Yes. And do we pay anything in the ration shop? Are you paying in ration shop? For not for sugar and kerosene. Kerosene could I At least for rice and wheat, you're paying. Rice and wheat is exemption. Dal and uh, sugar, you will have to, kerosene, you will have to pay. So if you say about the food grains, uh, mostly if you take the rice and wheat, it will be zero priced. At least in Tamil Nadu, it is zero priced or it is being priced at one rupee, two rupee, very minimal. But the minimum support price uh, which the government gives will be way high above the cost of production which the farmers are doing. So the government uh, makes a policy. If you look at minimum support price, you can understand that's going to be later becoming into the food subsidy bill. I hope you are able to follow what we are saying. They are incurring money to buy the products, but when they sell the products, they are selling it at zero. So how much ever they are buying, that total value will become the subsidy. So if you go on increasing the minimum support price, food subsidy is going to continuously increase. So that is what is actually happening. 
in this particular year alone uh, they would have done a lot of procurement and giving it off mainly because of the covid situation so that is all from the agriculture sector we are done with these two chapters the next uh, thing will be upon the industry social infrastructure and digital infrastructure so with that class we will be done for today we have uh, completed the chapter